Since 1992, he's been the CEO of the Bullet Foundation, headquartered in Seattle, and he was the major force behind the construction of the Bullet Center, which is the world's greenest office building. The foundation focuses on sustainability and resilient design in the Pacific Northwest and works from assets in the neighborhood of $100 million. Somehow, he had time to write a couple books along the way, including one co-authored with his wife in 2015 called Cowed, on the impacts of the beef and dairy industry. I won't waste your time with all the endless accolades of, that Dennis has earned, but suffice it to say, he was named by Time Magazine as a hero of the planet, by Life Magazine as one of the 100 most important Americans of the 20th century, and by organizations like the Sierra Club, Environmental Law Institute, Humane Society of America, and a bunch of others with their very highest awards. In other words, a national treasure. His visit to Denison has come about with the involvement of many people. In particular, I want to make sure you're aware of the campus entities uh, that are co-sponsoring this event. First off, Denison's Office of the President has been a major funder, as well as the Ronnenberg Fund. Additional support has been provided by the Sustainability Program, uh, the Departments of Physics, Communication, Earth and Environmental Science, and Biology, and also by the Global Commerce, Data Analytics, and Environmental Studies Programs. Having 10 co-sponsors all over campus strikes me as one of the best ways to highlight the integrative and interdisciplinary nature of the liberal arts. This is one example of what we do so well as an institution, so thanks to all those who've helped make this happen. With that, it's time for tonight's talk, Breaking Point or Breaking Through, Possibilities for a Green Future. Please welcome Dennis Hayes. Wow, thank you very much, Abram, for that introduction. Um, sadly inadequate, though it was. <laughs> uh, that, uh, Hubert Humphrey used to have this line that when he got that kind of over-the-top introduction, he says, that's the kind of introduction my father would have really enjoyed and my mother would have believed. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, in the summer of 1961, I was a junior in high school. And I, I took a couple of national tests and did well on them and got in the mail one day a letter from the National Science Foundation offering me a chance to come for the summer to Denison University to study ecology. I had never heard of ecology. I had never heard of Denison University, uh, but it was a free ride and I, I've always been a sucker for free rides. I got to climb on my first train and go all the way across the country. I, anything to get me out of the small little paper mill community that I grew up in would have been attractive. So I leapt at it and came. Um, we lived in a fraternity house and the university, with an eye to the fact that this was a mixed group, erected a wall between the section where the women would be and where the young men would be, uh, which we rapidly christened uh, the Wall of Jericho, uh, and took great pleasure in the fact that my roommate's name was Joshua. <laughs> and by the end of the summer, it had pretty well disappeared. When we weren't attending summer theater or just goofing off, we studied dragonflies at Ibao Pond with Bob Alritz. Um, he was a biology professor, an ardent environmental activist, and a, a mentor. And we learned some stuff despite the fact that we were young and inclined to uh, enjoy our first really big time away from home. For example, we learned that, that dragonflies have been around for 300 million years, uh, a thousand times as long as humans. That one dragonfly can eat hundreds of mosquitoes in one day, uh, which makes them pretty desirable critters in my part of the world. They can each control their four wings independently so the dragonflies can fly sideways, or they can fly backwards. Uh, that at the pond, the dragonflies are keystone species, just like wolves or elephants are in their ecosystems. Uh, you get up close to them and dragonflies are just gorgeous creatures that I paid no attention to at all until I came here and suddenly began to look at nature in a very small size way rather than simply the redwoods and, and the whales. 
Um, we also read Eugene Odom's Principles of Ecology. Um, and I discovered that there were some principles that govern relationships among all species. It was, it was the first time that I ever understood that energy was the real currency of life. Now, with the exception of some bacteria and volcanic vents in the middle of the Pacific, everything else alive on this planet directly or indirectly gets energy that came from the sun, was captured through photosynthesis, and then was released through this process, a very complicated process of oxidative phosphorylation. It's what allows me to speak, to move my arms, for all of us to do everything that we do. That, it's like the accounting system of, of biology. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but in retrospect, it would be pretty difficult to exaggerate how important that summer at Denison University came to be in my life. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes and, and explain a little bit more why. For now, getting into tonight's theme. Are we at a breaking point? It's pretty easy to paint a bleak picture of the world that you students are inheriting. Climate change in practical terms, it's no longer plausible for people to be denying it, and yet they do. There's no chance, in my view, that the world is going to meet its 1.5 degree Paris goal. Um, it's technically possible to get there in practical terms. Politically, it, it's, it's not going to happen. In 1950, the world emitted 6 billion tons of carbon dioxide annually. Last year, that had grown to over 34 billion tons. To meet the 1.5 degree things, we have to peak no later than 2025 and reduce carbon emissions by upwards of 40% by 2030. Uh, you can judge for yourself how likely that is, but based upon the last 40 years and even the much more intense progress that has been made in the last five years, it, it, to, to do that, it's not gonna happen. And for a great many young people, that has been enormously discouraging as though 1.6 degrees is the end of the world, or 1.7, or 1.8. This, this isn't that. This is not a place where you hit that point and they turn off the light switches. There will be some tipping points out there in the future, but, but uh, the fact that we don't meet this one is, is probably not going to be tragic. There will, however, be consequences, and you all know what a lot of those consequences are. They're already here. Droughts, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, forest fires, melting glaciers, rising seas, ocean acidification, disease, mass migration from lands that have been made uninhabitable. It's not an existential threat to our species. We're not going to be made extinct by climate change. But at some point, the world becomes dreadfully impoverished in terms of most of the things that we value. There are tipping points. They're irreversible on any time scale that's relevant to us, and we remain ignorant of just where they are. But some appear to be likely in your lifetime, uh, very likely. A couple may be even coming in my lifetime. We could well lose the Greenland ice sheet in my remaining years. So, bleak. Uh, uh, there are also some fundamental forces arrayed against you. One of the richest, most politically powerful, most, I have to say it, ruthless industries in the world, the carbon industry, is continuing to invest heavily in new fossil fuel resources. The most admired banker in the nation, Jamie Dimon at Chase, is the largest financier of new carbon fuel projects. The most admired investor in the United States, Warren Buffett, is a heavy investor in coal-fired utilities and coal-hauling railroads. In fact, he paid a premium for Burlington Northern precisely because of the new market that was opening up to ship coal to China. Myriad powerful politicians here and abroad are serving these same interests. Beyond climate disruption, as though that weren't enough, you also face a wave of forever chemicals, of endocrine disrupting chemicals, synthetic hormones, plastics that are overwhelming nature's ability to process them. There's a war going on in the Ukraine where the head of Russia has been wagging the nuclear saber, uh, something which we haven't seen for a very long time in international affairs. There is a threatened invasion of Taiwan, the widespread replacement of democratic governments around the world with totalitarian and autocratic regimes. 
There's a huge gulf between the fabulously wealthy and the rest of us. And there is a surge of racism, sexism, and religious animosity that I thought we had buried years in the past, and it's coming back with a vengeance. Within all of this is young people. You look back as I tended to when I was young at the good old days. When our parents had it, it was, it was easy. As a reminder that you are not the first generation to face seemingly impossible problems, I want to tell you a little bit about my world. I was born in the final days of World War II. That was the war that replaced the traditional wars where armies fought against one another with total war, war against populations. The death toll in World War II was somewhere between 70 and 85 million people. That's a 15 million death ratio that we can't really close because we don't know exactly how many deaths there were. The destruction was so total. And in a place like Dresden, with the Dresden firebombing, possibly the worst example in World War II, there was more than one bomb for every resident of Dresden. It just leveled what had been viewed as the Florence of the North. Um, the Soviet Union lost, I think, somewhere around 27 million people. China lost 20 million. Um, there's a remark attributed to Stalin, whether he said it or not, I don't know, that uh, a human death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. And it's, it's really difficult to figure what, what, what is 85 million people dying mean, but it's, it's pretty daunting. In grade school, I grew up under the constant shadow of thermonuclear war, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which forced us to think about Armageddon, about literally the end of the planet, occurred when I was a senior. At the peak of the nuclear arms race in 1985, the United States and Russia together had more than 70,000 nuclear warheads. Uh, enough to assure the extinction of humanity and a good chance that it might exterminate all animal life on Earth. To assure that these bombs worked, we and the Russians conducted atmospheric tests. When I was born, radioactive strontium-90, which is a fission product, essentially didn't exist. By the time I graduated from high school, every animal on Earth had strontium-90 in its bones or in its shells. My freshman year of college, the President of the United States was assassinated. Uh, five years later, Martin Luther King was assassinated. A few months later, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. During my college years, America was fighting a brutal, deeply unpopular war in Southeast Asia. We dropped more than seven and a half million tons of bombs in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. That is total double the total tonnage of bombs dropped throughout Europe and Asia by both sides in World War II, all on this narrow little strip of land in Southeast Asia. We bathed the countryside in Agent Orange, ravaging rich ecosystems, destroying food crops, and causing widespread birth defects. Meanwhile, at home, peaceful civil rights demonstrators were beaten with ax handles, attacked with police dogs, in the summer of 1967, race riots exploded in 150 cities. In 1968, that grew to more than 200 cities. Widespread arson, bombing, sniper fire. President Lyndon Johnson deployed 58,000 National Guardsmen to try to quell this before it turned into a full-blown revolution. Huge sections of Detroit, Newark, Washington, D.C., and other cities were burned to the ground. Basically, the point here is the good old days were not all lollipops and roses. It was possible to have a very bleak view when I was in college. And in fact, I was not at all sure that there would be life on Earth by now. But somehow we have managed to muddle through it. Uh, I managed to actually accomplish some rather spectacular things. And a big part of what I want to do today is convince you that uh, that sort of thing is still possible. When I was a sophomore in college, I was so depressed by all of this that I dropped out of college and spent three years hitchhiking around the world, mostly Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. I was looking desperately for a way to make sense of a seemingly doomed planet. 
And one night in the Namib Desert in Southwest Africa, for no reason that I can explain, my summer studying ecology at Denison University flooded back into my mind. And this was at a time when I was searching for some pattern, some way to explain what was going on in the world, how humanity was behaving the way that it did and what we could do to make that change. And I lay there awake, kind of questioning why, if ecological principles applied to all animals, what was different about humans? There was still this broad perception that there is humanity and then there's the whole rest of the animal kingdom and then there's plants over here as opposed to a functioning integrated ecosystem and that we were also animals. Mm -hmm. Some pretty clever, got opposable thumbs. We have other things that work to our advantage, but, but ultimately, why wouldn't those same principles be applied to the way that we organize our economy, organize our cities, organize ourselves? I wrestled all night with primitive ideas that we would now call urban ecology, industrial ecology, ecological economics, biomimicry, though there wasn't a vocabulary for any of that at the time. And I got up the following morning thinking that this was a more promising way to consider human affairs than anything that I had learned reading the Enlightenment philosophers or Marx or Ian Rand or Fanon or C. Wright Mills. And, any of the other lodestones of undergraduate education that had left me confused and bewildered. Um, I got up the following morning to lead a different life than I had been leading when I went to bed that night. It literally was a profound change for me. My, uh, my life is divided between the years before the Namib Desert and the years after. And crucial to that was Denison University and, and in particular, Bob Allritz. In any case, back to tonight's topic. What are the chances of breaking through? I painted a fairly bleak picture of the world that you're entering. It was, it was accurate, but it was not complete. For whatever reason, most of what we hear about climate is everything that is going wrong. And that nurtures, understandably, pessimism. And in Darwinian terms, pessimism offers no survival value. If you don't have any hope, you won't act. And if you don't act, you are doomed. Um, so let me balance it with some hopeful signs of genuine progress. Coal-fired electricity capacity in the United States, the number one target of the climate movement, has been reduced 42% since 2011. Although you would never guess it from the press coverage, carbon dioxide emissions in America peaked back in 2007 and have been going down ever since. Emissions have been declining even more steeply in the European Union and Japan. They continue to grow in China and India, but China also has the fastest growing renewable sector in the world, and, and it's making much of the renewable technology that it sells in Europe and the United States. China pledges to peak its carbon emissions no later than 2030, and there are very strong reasons to believe that that peak will come a few years before that if they continue going at the same direction that they are now. India continues to grow its emissions, but it's growing off a very small base, and it has among the lowest per capita carbon emissions in the world. And Hopefully, India will turn its corner soon on renewables and on efficiency. I, I will say in my narrow little vision into the world, there will be more people participating in Earth Day events in India this year than in the United States. That's become a very special target for us. In the United Kingdom, coal consumption last year was the lowest that it has been since, you know, wait for it the lowest it has been since 1757, before the Industrial Revolution. Um, in the United States, a combination of solar, wind, and batteries will comprise 80% of all new electrical generating capacity this year. 50% of all new generating capacity will be solar energy. I just about the only notable thing I did in my life that wasn't covered in Abram's wonderful introduction is there was a very important meeting with the Secretary of Energy back in 19, 
79, where the Undersecretary of Energy had commissioned a venture analysis of the prospects of lowering the cost of solar photovoltaics, the things that you put on your rooftops and out in fields in general. Well, Denison, you know photovoltaics. And it had proven that they could never come down to any reasonable price. And you read the document and you think, well, why would we throw away any more money on this? And, and this undersecretary, who was actually a distinguished scientist, a member of the National Academy, and later became the head of the CIA, he's a tenured professor at MIT, um, proposed that we shut down all solar research in the department because it had no future. And uh, I brought in my analyst with a rebuttal to that thing, and we fought it off in front of the Secretary of Energy, who was a guy named Jim Schlesinger, who for those of you who have hairlines like mine, he was not one of our environmental heroes. I mean, Jim Schlesinger was the head of the Atomic Energy Commission, he was head of the Office of Management and Budget, he was Secretary of Defense, he was head of the CIA, he'd done a great many things, but wild, radical proposals to do things in renewables was not what you expected of him. Though weirdly, we had a really good relationship because we were both sort of fact-based. And we presented our rebuttal to the undersecretary, and Schlesinger opted for us, kept the photovoltaic program going. And in fact, when in the Reagan administration, they came in and took our $130 million budget and stripped $100 million out of it, the photovoltaics program was one of the few things that remained relatively intact. And this year, it will provide 50% of new electrical generating capacity in the United States. There are these pivotal little moments where really important things either happen or don't happen. Worldwide sales of electric vehicles last year grew 55%. Sales in the United States grew 72%. Now those are off relatively small bases, but it doesn't take many years of 70%, 50% growth before suddenly you've transformed an entire vehicle sector. And with a whole series of new regulations out of the EPA, um, uh, coupled with the incentives that come out of the Inflation Reduction Act, I think that kind of growth is going to be continuing for a long time in the United States. I think the era of the internal combustion engine is essentially over. The climate crisis is certainly daunting, but after 40 years of screwing around, a lot of the world's political leaders are waking up, and a very big factor in that awakening has been a very large number of young people who've been out in the streets demanding a future. And, uh, that's you, and that has to continue. Transformational social change is essentially always led by the young, even when there's an old guy in front of it, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the actual troops out there that are moving things are almost always the young. The civil rights movement was blazed by the young. I mean, Martin Luther King was 26 years old when they firebombed his house. He was 39 years old, who for me is still really young, when he was assassinated. Uh, the anti-war movement was entirely a youth quake. The environmental movement was mostly kids. Uh, at the time of the first Earth Day, I was 25, and I was sort of the old man in the office. Um, and the climate fight uh, will be won by the young, be won by you. Yesterday, a reporter from The Guardian asked me whether I was optimistic or pessimistic. Um, literally every Earth Day, there are a handful of reporters who will track me down wherever I am to ask, are you optimistic or pessimistic? And I don't like that question. Um, and I think a much better description of my attitude is resolute. I mean, if you're optimistic or pessimistic, you think that there is some vague thing out there that is happening. It's entirely outside your control. It's driving this way, it's driving that way. It's fate, and it's not. Fate is a combination of millions of decisions made by millions of people and institutions, and it can be influenced and affected. And what you should be is not optimistic or pessimistic, but resolute that you're gonna be shaping those things to provide a, a sustainable future. When I was 19, I was about as pessimistic as it's possible to get. I was deeply schooled in the problems that we faced, and I could see no way to influence any of them. I hit rock bottom, and that's what caused me to drop out. Within six years, I had been the principal organizer of the largest planned demonstration in history. With 20 million participants, you can make a fairly decent case that Earth Day 
fundamentally transformed in its aftermath, the direction that America went and after that, the direction that the world hit. Uh, by the time I was 25, uh, excuse me, uh, the, the fall after that, we sent out to show that that Earth Day was not as it had been characterized in a few places, just a combination of school kids and hippies that were out sort of frolicking in the fields. We wanted to prove that we had some genuine political muscle. And we targeted 12 members of Congress who had horrible environmental records. Really easy to find members of Congress then with horrible environmental records. And we found 12 who were in districts where we had really strong Earth Day organizers who were prepared to be involved on a volunteer basis strongly in the election, where there was an environmental issue that really had traction in the community and might shift the way that people vote. And uh, where these politicians were on the wrong side of that issue. So we launched it, we had very little money. We were taking on incumbents, which it's very difficult to defeat. And in the end, in that election, we defeated seven of the 12. And in each of those races, it was clear that the environmental swing issue was what tilted the votes enough to influence the outcome of the election. And one of those was a guy named George Fallon, who was the chairman of the House Public Works Committee. Uh, that was in a day when seniority really counted. And if you were the chairman of a committee, nothing went without your support. So if you wanted to have a, a federal building, you wanted to have a courthouse, you wanted to have a prison, you wanted to have a bridge, you wanted to have a road, you had to get it past George Fallon. The fact that a bunch of kids raising environmental issues had booted George Fallon out of the house just was like a bomb exploding in the Capitol. At that point, everybody that was, had lousy environmental records were desperately trying to figure out what they could do to get on the right side of this issue. And that was a big part of what contributed over the course of the next five years to our establishing the EPA, passing the Clean Air Act, essentially unanimously in both houses of Congress. I mean, this is a piece of legislation that was ardently opposed by the automobile industry by the electric utility industry, the steel industry. Uh, it was opposed by the Chamber of Commerce, by, uh, by uh, the Fortune 500 companies, essentially. Despite that, it passed Congress unanimously. And that's when the society and the rest of the political establishment began to think, my God, this thing has really got some power. We passed next with the support of organized labor, or maybe they'd passed with our support, the Occupational Health and Safety Bill. We, it was being sold on the basis of implant pollution. The stuff that workers were getting in a very intense form was the stuff that the surrounding communities were getting in a somewhat more dilute form. Passed the Clean Water Act. Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act. We passed the Marine Sanctuaries Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, set up corporate average fuel efficient standards. We passed the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act, the National Forest Management Act, in five years. I mean, there's been nothing like that in American history with the exception of the New Deal. And the New Deal was headed by a hugely popular president whose party controlled both houses of Congress. We were doing it over the opposition of a, I mean, Richard Nixon vetoed the Clean Water Act. He was not an environmentalist, despite the fact that he signed this legislation when it came to his desk, in some part because he vetoed the Clean Water Act and Congress overrode his veto. And you don't want to do that too often if you're president of the United States. Um, it was something that has since caused trillions of dollars to be spent to make America a cleaner, healthier, safer, and more beautiful country. Um, that kind of change can come, and it is going to come at some point in the climate movement. We're seeing all the precursors there already, all of those optimistic things I was talking about that have happened. The, the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which puts an enormous amount of incentives into the right side. We've had a very tough time over history regulating out the bad stuff, but this time instead we're paying for the good stuff, and it's been received with much more wild enthusiasm. Um, the environmental revolution was, once it got launched, for the next several years propelled in some large measure by people who had jobs that almost didn't exist before 1970. 
environmental lawyers, environmental scientists and engineers, environmental journalists, environmental architects, environmental historians. There, there wasn't that set of environmental sociologists. There, there's, uh, th that sort of vocabulary simply didn't exist. But not only did the words change, but the position descriptions changed, what people did changed, and suddenly they had a stake in this thing surviving into the future. The climate revolution is going to bring far more jobs as we fundamentally reshape not just energy, but transportation, agriculture, the built environment, heavy industry. And I'm hoping that some of the people who are going to be leading this change are in this room tonight. Which brings me finally to the two most important thoughts that I want to leave you with. And this is really to those young people. Um, you should forget what President Kennedy talked about passing a torch to a new generation. Nobody ever passes a torch. Um, I can give you lots of examples. Today, the spotlight is on Senator Feinstein. And she's been a marvelous senator. She was a very good mayor before that. She did a number of wonderful things. And now she's 90 years old. She is not well in her body or her mind. She hasn't even been in Washington, D.C. in the last six months. Uh, because she's not there for the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings, President Biden's judiciary nominations are not moving anywhere. I mean, Donald Trump fundamentally, re with the help of Mitch McConnell, fundamentally shifted the whole nature of the federal judiciary. And Feinstein is making it impossible for Biden to begin to come in a bit on the other side. She doesn't want to pass the torch. She's already announced that she's going to leave in 2024. But she won't resign now, despite the fact that there is no reason for her to stay as a senator living in San Francisco and not really having her full wits about her, even if they can get her body back to Washington, D.C. People do not pass torches. Torches change hands when they're seized by somebody. And every one of you, at least in potential, has a torch. You need to find it seize it and carry it just as fast and just as far as you can. When you're my age, you will be astonished at how rapidly your entire life has passed. The final thought. Life has occasional clarity, but a lot of it is shades of gray. Uh, particularly if you manage to reach a position of any power, you'll find yourself frequently pummeled by a variety of truly fierce forces, and you'll find yourself thinking about this issue and arrayed ahead of you are a whole broad number of choices that you can make and you can in your mind figure out ways to justify just about any one of them. And this is the final advice. When you find yourself in that position where it is a tough choice, always take a meditative pause. Step back for a moment to think. You, th you think first about all the elements that are involved in that decision, but more importantly, during that period, think about whatever it is that matters most to you. I, I think of my daughter and granddaughter. I think of the majestic redwood groves that have become sort of my church. I think of the poor of this nation and the destitute of the world. I sometimes think about the dragonflies that have survived 300 million years and the butterflies that somehow managed to migrate thousands of miles with a brain so small that you can barely find it with a microscope. The whole secret to living a life of integrity is that meditative pause, that placing of any big decision in the broadest possible context, and then asking yourself a question. Not what's the easiest thing to do, not what's the most popular thing to do, not even what is the most profitable thing to do, just what's the right thing to do, and then do it. Thank you so much, Dennis, for that wonderful talk. Um, we have time to entertain some questions, so if people would like to ask, um, there are microphones here at the front of each of the aisles. Um, come on up and 
ask, and we'll be glad to entertain your, your questions. That's not, you know, pardon me, it's not a subject for opinions. I mean, there's really hard data. Right. I mean, it, it, it's, particularly if you care about climate, the, the impact, even if the electric car, and I don't want to talk about electric Hummers and electric huge vehicles, but electric sedans of the type that is common for vehicles in the United States, even if it gets all of its power from a coal-fired power plant, because of the increased efficiency of the um, electric motor, it, it will be less environmentally damaging than the other car. However, what it has that the other car doesn't have, the standard internal combustion engine, is the ability to be fueled entirely by clean electricity. And as we dramatically expand that, uh, you'll, you'll find most technologies, you're all familiar of this with, with computers and laptops and iPhones. It, it, the first embrace is by people who tend to have enough money that they can be flexible. If they buy something that doesn't work super well, it's not the end of the world for them. And that's true as well in this field. Uh, electric cars historically have been something you pay a premium for. Actually, with recent price cutting, that's getting very close to no premium. And if you can actually qualify under the Inflation Reduction Act, you can perhaps buy an electric car with superior performance for less than your internal combustion engine car. But if you do that and put solar panels on your roof and feed it off of that, um, then there's simply no comparison. People talk about the environmental damage of lithium mining, and, and it's very serious, but it's vastly less than the amount that's involved in uh, the, the elements of the carbon economy, both oil drilling, oil spills, and coal mining. Thank you. Again. <laughs> Um, so I just had a question, um, like, how do you think misinformation from our political leaders about the climate crisis, like, affecting... Could you get a little closer yeah, to the mic? of course. Um, how do you think misinformation about the climate crisis from our political leaders is affecting, like, people's perception, and how is that going to, like, affect our ability to, like, create change later mm -hmm. on in our lives? Yeah, no, this, this, this is a... The, one of the toughest questions that's out there. Um, when I was growing up, we had intermediaries that heard the claims of folks and tried to verify what was true, and Walter Cronkite and uh, uh, Chet Huntley and David Brinkley and others would, would act in that role of separating truth from falsity. And, and that isn't now true for all media, and it's uh, embarrassingly untrue for social media. So there is this flood of people making claims that have uh, what they refer to as a post-truth world. And I kind of prefer to back when it was a real truth world. I have no idea what to do about that. Um, the, we are in a period where regulation has enormous political opposition. It's the reason we have the Inflation Reduction Act being incentives instead of regulations, is that it would be really hard to achieve that with regulation. Uh, I don't know a way to deal with social media unless we can do with them what we used to be doing with all on-air things, where it was subject to a fairness doctrine, subject to an equal time doctrine. We could say that the airwaves are a public resource, and hence it can be regulated by a public authority. I can make an arm-waving argument that the internet would not have existed without ARPANET and all of the flood of federal dollars that went into creating it, um, and that we should be able to regulate that federally as well. I think you can build that argument, but you can't win with that argument with the current Supreme Court. And so I, I, we're, we're really in a bind. I, I wish I could give you a good answer, but. Uh, that's, you know, there are a lot of things I've got to leave to your generation, and I've never even, in my entire life, you, will, you won't believe this, but it's true. I have never cut a TikTok video. <laughs> uh, and we, we used to say that uh, 
we were the first generation raised on television. I, I got my first, our family got our first television set when I was 10. So uh, for me to try to comment on what we're going to be doing with the absolute threshold of new technologies with artificial intelligence and interesting new, but absolutely uncontrolled social media, I, I'm just out of my element. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Is there anything that you do on a personal level to help the environment that you think everyone should be doing? <laughs> um, sure. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've made the case actually in a couple of classes today when people were talking about the possibility that personal behavior was just a diversion because what you really needed to do was have governmental policy and to move corporations to be changing what they're doing. And, you know, the world's coming to an end, so you ought to recycle this can. And it just, uh, but I, I really believe not only that people can recycle cans and also petition their government. I mean, this is not an either or. But that by getting people to behave in a manner that is that comports with their values, is you create a much greater commitment to the values by people. I mean, organized religion has known this forever. Every religion insists that you make a whole series of things that, that says to the world, this is what I am. It might be your attire. It might be your behavior in a church. It might be eating meat on Fridays, any, any number of things. But it's that those behavioral changes reinforce the value system. We've got a ton of those environmentally, and they make sense. So yeah, um, I have an electric vehicle. Uh, I have just moved to a new house, but in my old house, I got all of my electricity from rooftop photovoltaics. Um, I eat entirely organic food when I'm at home, and as much as possible, I eat low on the food chain and as organic as I can get when I'm on the road. Uh, a controversial one, I had one child because your child has to be measured by its impact on the world. And if you have multiple kids, that impact goes up. Um, I, 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 everybody will choose different things that are important to them. Uh, and some of these, you know, it, I, I'd mentioned recycling cans as something that might be a little bit laughable, but, and this data may well be out of date. I said this earlier today and realized that I hadn't looked into this for 20 years or more, but at least the last time that I looked at it carefully, the amount of aluminum that went into aluminum cans in the United States was more than the amount of aluminum that goes annually into our aircraft fleet. I mean, substantially more, like twice as much. Um, you recycle an aluminum can? Yeah. But if 300 and some odd million Americans recycle three aluminum cans a week, uh, that is huge. Uh, so think of yourself not as I am going to change the world, but we are going to change the world and do your part. Thank you. Hi. Um, so my question is, it's clear that we live in a country with a lot of like internal political polarization. However, it seems that in recent years, we've seen a lot of unity in um, combating the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm wondering I, I'm, if- I'm sorry, you, you mumbled just a little bit there. A lot of unity in- In combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh. And so I'm wondering if you think that this unity and these joint efforts could be translated into combating climate change. Oh, geez. Uh, I, I so promised Abram that I would, on bottom line, come out hopeful on this. And I, I, I think you have, you have flagged the issue that most depresses me. The people who deny vaccines, people who deny that COVID exists, it's just a form of the flu. Have you looked at the death rates? It's just, I mean, in terms of post, yeah. A guy who was once my friend, Bob Kennedy, just announced for president of the United States on an anti-vaccine platform. I mean, he's not a dumb guy, but that's a dumb platform. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I would like to get, but, but what you have said is actually really important in terms of how you flag this. So I don't know how to make it work on climate. Um, the greatest unity is always with an enemy. Um, you know, and we are, as a country, sort of a counter puncher. Something hits and we respond to it as opposed to taking the initiative. I mean, you bomb Pearl Harbor and we transformed the nature of the American economy into a war machine. I mean, it was just astonishing what we got done overnight to arm ourselves and our allies. Um, 
you launch a satellite and suddenly the space race ignites and we counterpunch back with everything we have and soon place a person on the moon. Um, there's some way that we might be able to combine those things. Tragically, the, the enemy with regard to fossil fuels is, is pretty much the fossil fuel industry, which has been putting out very deceptive statements. It has funded a whole lot of right-wing wacko think tanks that crank out these things that for a long time the media was, on the one hand they say this, on the other hand they say that. They, they have genuinely been the villains here. But I'm not sure that there's a way that we can use that to advance a progressive agenda, though. There may well be. Uh, but, but your point of finding something that we do come together as a society on, uh, I, it, I'm, I'm praying that we will be ultimately doing more of that under climate than we did on COVID. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I've, like, I had a very similar question, but I have another one. Um, so I am wondering, what gives you hope about this generation and how, as a generation, can we empower the next to be twice as impactful? Hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the things that we've been talking about tonight were not talked about at all when I was young. I mean, it was just, just a totally different set of issues that we were facing. Um, and each generation has its own challenges, and thus far each generation has managed to rise to those challenges. Um, you, 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 you'll have trouble believing this, but you will never have more time on your hands than you have at the moment. I mean, once you're out of school and you've got a family and you're working and, uh, it, 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 and, and then you've got kids that you need to care for and, and on and on, it, it becomes harder. My, my hope for this generation is actually the same as my hope for my own generation. You have more time when you're young and you have more time when you're old. And interestingly, when you're old, you tend to have more resources and you tend to have maybe a little bit, if not wisdom, at least data available. You've gone through a life. And I, I have hope that your generation, instead of like my generation, scoffing at the elders and saying, what the hell do I care about the wisdom that was accumulated 60 years ago in the country, will instead reach out to us and form this kind of green-gray coalition that together we may be able to get all those people in the middle to tilt over. Thank you. The, the other thing for your generation is you are the people who do do TikTok videos, who do understand viral <laughs> communication. Um, and there is absolutely no reason why we should have the people at Fox News run circles around us. I mean, we, the, these things are free. The ability to move out onto any of these platforms is just a matter of finding the time and the creativity and you do it. And when people put up things that are false, rebut them and do it with humor. Get people to laugh at themselves and have other people laugh at them. I, I, you, you can do things that we can't do at all, and there may be some things that we old people can do that, that you can't do yet. Okay, so. Hi. Hi. I'm only three or four years younger than you are, but so we've had the same experience. You've I know there's got a lot, a lot of more hair about, about overpopulation. Yeah back when we were in our reproductive years there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had three kids, but one's adopted, so we did just replace <laughs> ourselves and <laughs> achieve zero population growth. You're forgiven, my friend. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, now we're faced with uh, the United States and China both having shrinking workforces and they're concerned there are not going to be enough people working to support all of us old guys in our retirement years. Um, what part do you see population playing in this whole picture as we go along here? Well, it's, it, it goes back to those ecological principles, one of which is carrying capacity. For most animals, when you think of carrying capacity, it's having enough food. And if you've got enough food, then the population expands. And when you run out of food or you run into disease or some other vector, the population shrinks. With humans, we can feed a, an awful lot more people than we currently have. 
uh, particularly if we were to move down and feed them more sustainable diets. But that does not, that, that's not how we think of a satisfactory life, really being able to have enough nutrition to keep body and soul together. People want to have education, they want to have entertainment, they want to have uh, all of the amenities of modern life. There was in the 1980s, something of a, I mean, Paul Ehrlich was one of my mentors when I was at Stanford, so I, I got caught up in the backlash of that. And, and in the population bomb, there were two things going on. One is, is a whole lot of trends that he saw and forecast into the future simply didn't move on to the future. The Green Revolution came along and a bunch of things that he thought were gonna happen didn't happen. Another part of it was that he was consciously trying to have a self-undoing hypothesis, which has been fairly common in environmentalism. You all know about a self-fulfilling hypothesis. Well, the self-undoing hypothesis is say, this is where we're going. This is what it's going to look like when we get there in an effort to undo it, make that hypothesis. And he was trying to do that with population. Uh, so you, you take his his work, which is still right. You take population times prosperity times the choice of technology and it lends itself to what the carrying capacity will be. There was that period when the radical posture in the American left was all, there is a population problem and all of it is in the United States because we have so much more impact on the planet per person. And there's almost no impact on the planet of the peasants in China. And my response to that, which turns out to have been far more prescient than I dreamed it would be, was, are you sure that those peasants want to remain peasants forever and have their great-grandchildren also have no impact on the environment, which is to say, enjoy no creature comforts, no higher education, no mobility? No. Um, it's just not. So population is one of those dynamics. If you, if you grow the population and it achieves something like a Swedish style of life, which is less than the United States, certainly in terms of its impact, but far more than, say, China, and vastly more than India or Nigeria or Central African Republic. I mean, here's a data point for you. One Boeing 747 consumes carbon fuel at the same rate as the Central African Republic. One plane, one country. I mean, you just, you just can't think of a more staggering difference between the wealthy and the destitute. So uh, if, if we can somehow make this work so that uh, we have everybody in the world, more or less, at the level of a Swede, then my hunch is that our carrying capacity is something on the order of six billion people. It may be less than that. It almost certainly is not more than that. Um, and that means we've got to go down from here and rather not go down with war or plague. But what seems to happen is people get an increasing degree of prosperity and they have fewer kids. It, 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 and, and it also coincides entirely with women having education about birth control and access to birth control things. Women's empowerment is probably the single most important factor in all of this. And that tends to go with greater degrees of prosperity. Um, so the, there, there are a bunch of different projections out there, uh, including the mainstream United Nations projection, which is 10 billion people and basically leveling off because of all of these phenomena then. At, at that level, maybe 15% of them will be in Nigeria. That's gonna be a really difficult figure. How are you gonna be supporting that many people there? And, and there are other complications in it as well. Um, and the biggest may well be that our economic system is predicated entirely upon growth. And if you talk to an economist when they're doing their projections for what will happen five years from now, a key element in that is what is the population? And it's population times the level of prosperity. In the um, capitalism will not survive in its current form under a stable population. And that, that that's, um, Social security is part of it, but, but there are a great many other parts of it as well. And so that's, that's something that the, the next generation has to figure out the elements of an economic system that work in a, uh, basically a, a stationary state of economic growth where you have 
creativity, you have arts, you have culture, but you don't have more steel, you don't have more commodities year after year after year into the future. And, and we should be able to handle that. That's not that big an intellectual challenge. Uh, I'm rambling a little bit, but maybe I'm rambling a lot. But the, the bottom line of this is I, the carrying capacity is very real. There may be no more important lesson that we can get out of ecology than you can't exceed it for the long run or you're gonna have collapse because we are like other species in that regard. And we are not gonna be satisfied simply by being fed. Thank you. So we're about two billion over it now, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that, there, there are people who think that I'm wildly optimistic in that appraisal. We, we may be four billion over if we're talking about Sweden. And it's not clear that the world is going to be super happy with Sweden, but many Americans will be. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you're talking with people who don't share the same beliefs and ethics on you around the environment, uh, would you have an argument that you say is very effective? for convincing people, or do you think that's kind of a lost cause? What's your opinion on that? Hmm. Well, there are people <laughs> for whom it's a lost cause. Um, somebody famous said, and I can't remember the quote, that it is very difficult to convince somebody of something of his well-being depends upon not believing it. And uh, yeah, they, you've got conflicts that come out of economic forces and cultural forces and even religious forces in this that, that some of the creationists that don't don't accept that basic facts are, are real um, the, the, the most useful instrument that we've successfully used in this is children um, I mean, really important. I, and I, I come out of an Earth Day perspective, but it's not just Earth Day. Environmental education across the board has, has gotten kids to come to terms with a fact-based reality. This is something that's obviously uh, you're, you're seeing being opposed in Ohio in the state legislature already in K-12 education, and even university education. Where the famous ones are Ron DeSantis, who's trying to restructure what can and cannot be said to kids. But to the extent that the educational system gets kids to, uh, to understand what's going on, the importance of that is not what everybody says, which is you are tomorrow's leaders, you know this. The importance of that is that in almost every family, the parent wants to be a hero to his kids. And if your kids come and they're talking to you calmly and sensibly about something, making an argument that is a powerful one, they're more likely to listen to their own kids. And they'll challenge you, and you just have to be good enough, smart enough, and if I will, resolute enough to keep coming back and hopefully get them changed. Okay, we've ran out of questions. And we've run out of time, so uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Dennis, for a wonderful